I wasn't sure if I was going to be speaking alongside the background music there. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. My name is Richard Suskind. I'm the president of the Society for Computers and Law, and I'm just doing a very brief welcome to set the scene for this evening. This evening focuses on two remarkable people. On the one hand, Brian Neal. On the other hand, Haben Germa. First, let me just say a couple of words about Brian, in whose memory this annual lecture is held. He passed away very sadly in December 2017. He was one of the first members of the society. Indeed, he attended its first meeting in 11th of December 1971. And for many of us, he's been a mentor and an inspiration, and certainly our more, in my view, our most distinguished president. Much of what we see today in the reform of our courts, in the shape of court technology, can be directly linked to his contribution that began in the 80s. And we're very pleased, we're always delighted to welcome members of Brian's family here this evening. It's a great pleasure to have you with us. As for Haben, we first met in March. I was very excited because I'd been invited to New York to speak to an organization called the GC50. This is the top general counsel in the 50 largest companies in the world. And I was determined to make my mark. I don't think anyone remembered anything I said that day because I was followed by Haben. Um, she was entirely remarkable, memorable, she swept everyone along, both by the content and the manner of her presentation. And I felt she had to come to the UK to share her experiences and her insights with our community. So it really is a privilege for the Society of Computers and Law to be hosting her first lecture in this country. I feel Haben and I have now been friends for years. We've been communicating by email, but it's always so friendly and warm and lighthearted. She's a wonderful person. And her story itself is one that everyone should read. There are books available today. I know as an author, it's great to have a book, book plug. So here's a major plug. I wouldn't want to see any of you leaving without a copy and you're clutched in your hands. So there are two people in many ways so very different, from very different eras, very different backgrounds. But they share a passion for justice. They share a generosity of spirit. They both have great senses of humor. And so these two individuals for whom we gather this evening have much in common and we've much to learn from them both. I'm going to leave a more detailed introduction to happen to Katia Ramo of CMS, who herself comes with a remarkable story. And if I could welcome Katia to the stage and hand the baton to her. Ladies and gentlemen, have the best of evenings. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Catherine Katia Ramo. I'm a technology and media lawyer with a global law firm CMS. I'm also the founder and chair of, sorry about the background noise. <laughs> Also the founder and chair of uh, CMS Enabled Disabilities and Wellbeing Network for the past six years. On behalf of the Society for Computers and Law, I'm honored and delighted to welcome Haben Germa to the UK to give her first lecture this evening. As most of you will already know, Haben is a global icon of disability advocacy. She is the first deaf-blind person to graduate from Harvard Law School Haben advocates for equal opportunities for people with disabilities. As you may know, President Obama named her a White House champion for change. She received the Helen Keller Achievement Award and a place on the Forbes 30 under 30 list. President Bill Clinton and Chancellor Angela Merkel have also honored Haben. Haben travels the world teaching the benefits of choosing uh, inclusion. As if all of this was not enough, in August of uh, this year, she published her first book, Haben, the Deaf-Blind Woman Who Conquered Harvard Law, which I understand now it is on the bestseller list. 
Before I give the floor to Haben, I wish to extend my deepest thanks and gratitude to Professor Suskin, Caroline Gold, and Sue McLean for making this event happen. As a practicing global technology and media lawyer with five disabilities and a disability advocate myself, I was very impressed and touched that we are being given the voice and platform to demonstrate the positive impact of technology innovation on our lives and the lives of many people with disabilities. You will have an opportunity to ask Haben as many questions as you wish with the time, allo with the time allocation after her speech. Um, and I hope this evening would be and will be one of many uh, evenings to come in the same sphere. One last thing, uh, please join me in wishing Harbin, uh, Milo, and Gordon a very happy Thanksgiving in advance, which is on Thursday. I know how hard it is uh, to be miles away from family on this important holiday. Harbin choose, chose to spend it with us here this week, so hope uh, Hope she enjoys it here and have some wonderful turkey from Norfolk. Without, without any further ado, I give you Haben and Milo who will show us the magic of technology innovation and how it all happens. Thank you. Good evening. Silence? <clears throat> Good evening. Thank you. I appreciate the warm welcome. Thank you to Katia and Richard for the introductions. And a huge thank you for the Society for Computers and Law for welcoming me and bringing me here to the UK. As you heard, I'm deaf blind. I have limited vision and hearing. All of us have the desire to connect, to talk with others, to form friendships, to communicate with family. Most people around me don't know sign language or braille. So as I was growing up, I was asking myself, what can I do? How can I make it easier to communicate and connect with people? I started by asking myself, what are my strings? One of my strings is my sense of touch. I grew up learning Braille, and in 2010, a new piece of technology came out that not only had digital Braille, but also had Bluetooth. And that gave me the idea to connect it with keyboards. Lots of people around me know how to type, especially millennials. So I thought, let's connect this to a keyboard and I can hand people keyboards, they can type and I'll be able to read it. And that's what we're doing today. I'm going to hold up the device. It's a braille computer. There's dots on the bottom. I run my fingers over the dots to feel the letters. There's a typist in the front row with a wireless keyboard typing feedback from the audience. So when you said, good evening, or you failed to say good evening, <laughs> all of those details are getting back to me. So it's really important to stay connected I value getting feedback from people, and disability does not have to be the thing that gets in the way. We can develop technology and set up structures in our society to ensure that everyone has access. Disability is rarely the barrier. 
If there are barriers, it's created by society. And it's up to all of us to work together to remove those barriers so everyone has access. My name is Haben. The name Haben comes from Eritrea. It's a small African country. Ethiopia is to the south, and to the north is the Red Sea. My mother grew up during the war between Eritrea and Ethiopia. There was a lot of violence, a lot of fear. Schools were places for students to come together and hear stories from around the world. Stories are powerful. Stories influence the organizations we design, the products we build, and the futures we imagine for ourselves. My mother heard stories that America is the land of opportunities, the land of civil rights, and the stories inspired her to take the dangerous journey, walking from Eritrea to Sudan. It took about three weeks to do that walk. She was in Sudan for about 10 months, then a refugee organization helped her come to the United States. Several years later, older, wiser, my mother realized it's not geography that creates justice. It's people that create justice. Communities create justice. All of us face the choice to accept unfairness or advocate for justice. As the daughter of refugees, a black woman, disabled, lots of stories say my life doesn't matter. I had to learn to resist those stories. There are people in the Ethiopian and Eritrean communities who would tell my parents, poor thing, she'll never go to school, she'll never get a job. They had to learn to resist those stories. I define disability as an opportunity for innovation. If you face a challenge, it's an opportunity to come up with new solutions. And that's what I've been doing. I found a way to connect a braille computer and keyboard so that I had easier access to communication. I travel around with a guide dog, which took months of training. And this is not unique. People with disabilities have been coming up with solutions all throughout our history. These are hidden stories. We want to get them out into the world so more people recognize that disability drives innovation, and many of us are talented. I'll share some examples. Next slide. We have a video with sign language, specifically American Sign Language. A young man is signing. I'm holding my hands over his hands to feel the signs. Deaf communities all over the world have developed sign languages. Sign language is a form of innovation. If you cannot hear spoken language, you can create a visual language. If you cannot hear or see language, you can create a tactile language. And deaf communities have done this in their own unique ways. The dominant one in the US is American Sign Language. Here, it's British Sign Language. In France, they have French Sign Language. So it's each community coming up with their own visual language. And if they're deaf blind, coming up with tactile sign language. Because there are many different ways to communicate. And people with disabilities are constantly innovating and coming up with new ways to connect and share information. Another way to communicate. Next slide is dance. And they have a video of salsa dancing. When I was in middle school, I was taken out of physical education courses because people assumed I wouldn't be able to participate. Then I went to a camp where they had a blind dance instructor teaching salsa. Blind people who can hear, could hear the music and respond and engage to the music. Someone who's deaf and can see, can see the other dancers and see the beat, or watch the hands of the musicians and see the beat. I can't see the other dancers. I can't hear the beat in the music, but I can feel the rhythm and beat through the hands and shoulders of the people I'm dancing with. 
There's lots of different ways to communicate information. I'm really excited for the potential of innovation at the intersection of touch and technology. Skin is one of our largest organs. If we pay attention, we can develop tactile intelligence. And blind individuals and others with disabilities who've spent time developing tactile intelligence can help drive these innovations. I encourage tech companies and those who advise tech companies to increase hiring of people with disabilities because it'll help bring in new ideas and drive innovation. If you don't do anything, the barriers persist. The dominant story is that people with disabilities are a burden and there's no access. But you all have the power to change the story, to create access. I've been really successful in life because there have been people who've done the work to remove barriers. One of my favorites was a high school teacher. She came up to me one day and asked, would you like to try surfing? And I thought to myself, how would a blind person surf? But I told her, yes, let's do it. Let's give it a try. And so she introduced me to an organization that does tandem surfing. Next slide. In tandem surfing, we have a large board. There's a water guide in the back. I'm in the front. The water guide helps steer around other surfers and sharks. I loved the experience. You can feel the vibrations of the wave through the surfboard, through your feet. You can feel the sun, the wind. That specific organization did not do surfing lessons. Tandem is beautiful. It's wonderful to do something in connection with others. But I wondered, would it be possible for me to surf on my own, on my own surfboard? I reached out to surf schools in California, and they told me, we've never heard of a deafblind surfer. Then I found a surf school that said, we've never heard of a deafblind surfer, but let's try, let's find a way. So we had a lesson. Next slide. In this video, I'm surfing on my own surfboard, and that gives me the opportunity to practice standing up and riding the wave on my own. Beside me is the instructor on his own surfboard, and because he's right next to me, he can help steer around other surfers and sharks. <laughs> Some engineers and tech designers tell me it's impossible to make computers and apps accessible. Computers are visual. There's no way blind people can access computers and apps. And I tell them, there's always a way. If a deaf blind person can surf, you can find a way to make apps accessible and smart cars accessible. Anything can be designed to be accessible if you take the time to do the work. And there already exist guidelines to teach tech developers how to make their content accessible. For websites, it's the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. For apps, there's Android and iOS Accessibility Guidelines. A lot of this information has been out for years. So remind your colleagues and others you work with to design information to be accessible. I'm an advocate for people with disabilities. I was not always an advocate. Society often tells us that the disabled are a burden, and sometimes we inadvertently internalize that. So I had to learn to resist that and believe that I do belong in the room and should have a place at the table. I started to learn this in college. I went to Lewis and Clark College. It's a small school in Portland, Oregon in the Northwest. It rains a lot there but maybe not as much as here. <laughs> that school celebrated pioneers. Everything at the school was called pioneers. Their football team, the pioneers. Their newspaper, the pioneer log. 
their bus, the Pioneer Express. So I thought maybe this would be a place that would celebrate difference in disability. Maybe I'd be able to chart my path through the unknown and be supported by the school. They did an amazing job providing me with all my textbooks in Braille. The exams were in Braille. They even worked with the outdoor club so that I could participate in rock climbing and kayaking. There was just one problem. The cafeteria was a central place for students to eat, hang out, and relax between classes. When you enter the large room, along three of the walls were panoramic windows showcasing Portland's rain. <laughs> along the fourth wall were food stations. Sighted students would walk in, browse the menu, then go to their station of choice. I couldn't read the menu. Blindness wasn't the problem. The problem was the format of the menu. So I went to the manager and explained, I can't access the menu because of the format. Can you provide it in Braille or post it online or email it to me? I have assistive technology that allows me to do email and websites. The manager said, we're very busy. We don't have time to do special things for students with special needs. Just to be clear, eating is not a special need. <laughs> Everyone needs to eat. There's this myth that there are two kinds of people, independent and dependent. But we're all interdependent. Many of you like drinking coffee. I bet very few of you grow your own coffee beans. You depend on other people to grow the coffee. And that's OK as long as you're honest about the fact that we're all interdependent. We all have times when we depend on other people. The manager did not recognize this. As a vegetarian, it was really frustrating not to know the food choices. There were about six different stations. I would choose one at random, get food, find the table, try the food, and discover an unpleasant surprise. It was really frustrating, but I told myself, at least I have food. Many people around the world struggle for food. Who am I to complain? My mother, when she was my age, was a refugee in Sudan. Maybe I should just be grateful, like the manager suggested. Sometimes we engage in the oppression Olympics. We compare struggles, point to someone and say, they have it worse, so I'm not going to complain. But that accommodates broken institutions. That allows barriers to persist. I talked to advocates, did research, then went back to the manager explaining, the Americans with Disabilities Act prohibits discrimination against students with disabilities. <laughs> I had no idea how to take legal action. I was 19. I couldn't afford a lawyer. Now I know there are nonprofit legal centers that support students with disabilities. But back then, I didn't know that. All I knew is I had to try, had to do something. The next day, the manager promised to make the menus accessible. They started emailing the menus to me. Life became delicious. The next year, a new blind student came to the college, and he had immediate access to the menus. That taught me when I advocate, it helps everyone who comes after me. There are many small barriers in our communities, barriers affecting women, people of color, people with disabilities. Sometimes we allow the small barriers to persist, focused on the larger ones. But those small barriers add up. When you take the time to address a small barrier, you build up the skills to tackle the larger obstacles. And that experience taught me that I have the power to remove those larger obstacles as well. I entered Harvard Law in 2010. 
Harvard told me they never had a deaf-blind student before. I told them I've never been to Harvard Law School before. <laughs> we didn't know what all the solutions would be, but we engaged in an interactive process to find the solutions and make it work. Next slide. We have a photo from graduation. Dean Minow is handing me my diploma. Dean Minow and I are wearing academic regalia and the guide dog is wearing a fancy fur coat. <laughs> what I just did is called image description. Image description provides access to blind individuals. When you post photos online to social media, include image descriptions. It also helps with search engine optimization. So more people will find your content, both disabled and non-disabled. Some history about Harvard. Harvard was not always accessible. Helen Keller was a very well-known deaf-blind woman who was brilliant, hardworking, really wanted to go to Harvard, but they wouldn't admit her. Back then, Harvard only admitted men. Her disability didn't hold her back. Her gender didn't hold her back. It was the community at Harvard that excluded all women. Over time, that community changed and opened its doors to women, people of color, and people with disabilities. It's society that creates barriers. And it's up to all of us to do the work to remove those barriers so that schools can benefit from the talents of the disabled and employers can benefit from the talents of the disabled. One last thing about this photo. The dog in the photo is not the same dog that's on stage. The dog in the photo is Maxine, my first love, wonderful seeing eye dog. She traveled all over with me, college, Harvard Law, even going to the White House. Last year, she passed away due to cancer, and it was really difficult to lose someone who traveled with me by my side for nine years. I almost didn't want to get another dog because it's so painful to lose a dog. I gathered my courage and went to the Seeing Eye, a guide dog school in Morristown, New Jersey. I trained with this guy, and his name is Milo. We've been working on our relationship for a year now. <laughs> He's a really good traveler, really sweet dog, but he didn't go to Harvard. <laughs> Next slide. You know accessibility is important, but sometimes you encounter stubborn, difficult people who refuse to be accessible. On screen are arguments you can use to convince people to choose inclusion. The first one is reach. There are over a billion people with disabilities around the world. That's a huge market. So advise tech companies to invest in accessibility so they reach more customers, which means more revenue. Another argument you can use is that accessible digital content is more accessible both for disabled and non-disabled. We call this the curb cut effect. This started out in California, the city of Berkeley, installed curb cuts on sidewalks. Curb cuts are the ramps at the end of the sidewalk, and wheelchair users gained the freedom to step to get on and off the sidewalk once they installed curb cuts. Parents with strollers started using the curb cuts. Travelers with luggage benefited from the curb cuts. Kids with skateboards loved the curb cuts. The whole community started using them. And we see this in other disability features. 
digital content that's designed to be accessible ends up benefiting both disabled and non-disabled people. If you add text to videos, captions, transcripts, search engine optimization, more people will find your content. Same thing with image descriptions. So it's better design overall. Another example, if you invest in accessibility, it drives innovation. Disability design has sparked new ideas throughout our history. A lot of these stories are hidden, and I'll share a few of them. Back in 1808, there were two friends in Italy, one blind, one sighted. This was back before email, back before even Braille. If a blind person wanted to write a letter, they had to dictate it, and someone else would write it for them. These two friends couldn't do that. Their letters had to stay secret. They were love letters. They used this as a design challenge. Hmm, how can we create a way to write that doesn't require sight? They ended up building one of the first working typewriters. With a typewriter, you can memorize the layout of the keys. And by typing with the touch, you can produce letters. Nowadays, lots of people write letters on keyboards, and some of the fastest typists are touch typists. Disability drives innovation. Love drives innovation, too. Another example from more recent history. Vint Cerf is one of the fathers of the internet. He's deaf, hard of hearing. Before the internet existed as we know it today, Deaf people struggle to communicate long distance. Vince Cerf built one of the earliest email protocols. Through email, deaf people can communicate long distance. Guess who else started using email? Hearing people. Lots of hearing people use email. If you design for disability, you could end up building the next big thing, like email. So these are some great arguments you can use for anyone who's resistant to accessibility. Tell them they'll reach more customers. They'll drive innovation. They'll increase content discoverability. If the stubborn person is still not convinced, tell them about legal requirements. <laughs> we have the UK Equality Act that prohibits discrimination. In the US, the Americans with Disabilities Act I actually brought a case against a digital library called Script. The case was called National Federation of the Blind versus Script. Blind readers wanted to read books on the digital library, and the library was programmed in a way that blind readers could not read the books on the app or website. At first, Script refused, saying that the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, only applies to physical places, not digital places. I disagreed. My team disagreed. And I wrote a brief arguing that the Disabilities Act, the ADA, applies to online businesses. The judge in that case listened to both sides and agreed with our team. Online businesses must comply with the ADA. The, the law was designed to be broad and evolve with technology. So organizations have a legal obligation to make services accessible. Litigation is expensive and time consuming. It's much easier to choose inclusion rather than risk dealing with me. <laughs> I want to share a short video that shows how an accessible app works, and how blind people use smartphones and computers. Next slide. So when I'm using my phone, I use VoiceOver. VoiceOver can speak out loud and send information to the digital braille display. News. Checking for new news. National Geographic, unread. World's largest rodents on lamb from Toronto Zoo. I'm panning right on the Braille display using the advanced forward button. 
If I wanted to instead use hand gestures on the iPhone, I could flick right with one finger. To open an item, I can double tap anywhere on the screen. Text size, caption, title, with title, world's large title. After escaping from the High Park Zoo in Canada, two capybaras have eluded capture for by Jason Biddle. Published June 9. Most people do their best to avoid rodents of unusual size. But after a pair of capybaras escaped from Toronto's High Park Zoo on May 12th, alert. Gordon. Hi, I'm at the door sushi. Pot of food. Fish cake with swirl design. <laughs> My friend's at the door, so I'm just gonna let him know. Close. Button. Reply. Button. Messages notification. Hang. In. There. I'm. Almost. Done. With. This. Demo. Send. Button. VoiceOver has allowed me to access more information, news, mail, and messages. And it's also a way for me to know when friends are at the door. Next slide. The voice that was speaking is called a screen reader. And we have screen readers on different operating systems, from Android to Windows. If you design with access in mind, then blind people can use your apps and websites. We don't want special apps for people with disabilities. We want the mainstream apps to be accessible to everyone. Separate is never equal. You might start out with good intentions, but down the line, the disabled app gets fewer resources, fewer updates, and that's not equal. So all the mainstream digital services, all the websites and apps, design them with access in mind. Other technology, cars, spaceships, also build them to be accessible. If you're not sure how, ask. A lot of the guidelines are available freely online, or you can connect with disability organizations that can help can, that can help consult and answer many of your questions. Another feature of accessibility is captions. Captions are the text that appear on screen. It also helps hearing individuals. Sometimes people are situationally disabled. Maybe a room is too noisy to hear the audio. Maybe someone does not want others around them to know that they're watching a video. So there are lots of reasons that captions benefit hearing people as well. Facebook did a study and found that videos with the captions reach a larger audience and have an increased view time of about 12%. So it's great marketing to include accessibility, such as captions. Another feature is support for assistive devices, like braille displays or switch control. Switch control helps individuals with limited mobility. Maybe someone can't use a standard mouse or keyboard, then they might use switch control. And again, the accessibility guidelines, web content accessibility guidelines, Android and iOS accessibility guidelines will help guide the process in making apps and websites accessible. These are some of the things that exist currently. Keep innovating. Keep thinking about new ways to share and connect. As you design new tech, don't make assumptions about what people with disabilities can or can't do. Intend for all people to use their services and products. Design everything to be accessible. Several years ago, I went to China for the first time. It's a long flight from San Francisco to Beijing. So when I arrived, I went straight to my hotel room where I discovered something strange. I was holding it in my hand, trying to figure out what it was. It almost felt like a piece of fruit. I asked myself, hmm, should I taste it? I was really curious to figure out what it was, but not curious enough to bite into an unknown object. <laughs> so instead, I took a picture with my phone and texted it to a friend asking, what is this? 
Is it safe to eat? Next slide. It was dragon fruit. I learned that I like dragon fruit. There's some people who would think, don't bother making a camera app accessible. Blind people would never use cameras. But we do take photos. Design for everything to be accessible will surprise you and find new ways to use features. So include access for all the features. Next slide. We have a photo with President Obama. He's standing at a table typing on a keyboard. I'm on the other side of the table reading from a Braille computer. I met President Obama at the celebration of the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The ADA promises equality, but equality only happens with enforcement. So advocates who'd been teaching about the ADA and enforcing the ADA gathered together with the president to celebrate 25 years of history. President Obama usually communicates by voice. He graciously switched from voicing to typing so I can access his words. Inclusion is a choice. All of you have the choice to accept unfairness or advocate for justice. Disability is one of the largest minority groups. Anyone can join at any time. All our bodies change as we age, and we deserve dignity and access at every stage in our lives. Next slide. I wrote a book, and I titled it Haben. In Eritrea, in the language of Tigrinya, Haben means pride. A lot of people are ashamed of disability and try to hide it. A lot of people are ashamed of what makes us different. I want to create a community with disability pride where people can identify as disabled and not feel any shame and can get the accommodations they need and find the tools they need online and use all the tech that's available to non-disabled people. It's gonna take time to reach that world, but you all can help in working toward that goal and creating inclusion. Friends, uh, members of the society, if you'll bear with me just for 30 seconds more, um, it's my absolute privilege, Harbin, to offer the vote of thanks on behalf of the Society for Computers and Law today. It's also my utter nightmare to follow you and to know that despite all my efforts, I'm a far worse surfer than you are. <laughs> Can I extend a really hearty thank you on behalf, I think, of all of us for coming from the US to the UK to speak to us today and to share with us. We are, as we know, an educational charity. Our strap line is tech law for everyone. So I think Harbin's messages are timely. I think they're pretty essential. I think uh, I certainly will take home uh, a copy of your book for my children. And I think we should all take home something from this speech that one of the things you said much earlier was that defining disability as an opportunity for innovation. I think that's fantastic. And that certainly resonated with me. So enough from me. If you would please join me in thanking Harbin and then join us for a drink. Thank you, Harbin. Thank you.